So again, welcome everybody. And like I said, this is the third installment of the Forest Stewards Guild's Appalachian Cove virtual series. Um, this event is about non-native invasive plants in Appalachian coves. Just want to remind people to please keep your microphones muted throughout the, the whole um, webinar so we don't have any background noise uh, that interrupts our great presentations that we have going on today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box and we can answer them at the end of both presentations. And let me see here. Um, yeah, in case you missed it, we had two other events happen in August and September and they are up on the Guild's YouTube channel. The first one was about um, American ginseng and the second one was a virtual tour of Tom's Run Preserve in West Virginia. And so Jen just put a link in the chat box for that. So if you ever wanna take a look at that, if you missed those, that's up on our YouTube channel. And so today we have two great presentations um, by Eco Foresters in North Carolina. The first one is with Andy Tate. Um, and he has been the Eco Forestry Director at Eco Foresters since its inception in 2015. He oversees all of Eco Forester's Southern Appalachian forestry projects, including forest stewardship planning and timber sale administration. And prior to this position, he spent six years conducting on the ground research on forest restoration at the US Forest Service Southern Research Station and the Bent Creek Experimental Forest in Asheville. In addition, he also did hands on ecologically beneficial stewardship on both public and private woodlands in Western North Carolina. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to you, Andy, to get us started. Great, thank you so much for this, Dakota. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and present to y'all uh, a really important topic. Um, so yeah, just, I've been introduced here and, and talk about in non-native invasive plants in Appalachian Coves in particular. Um, and I am a registered forester in North Carolina, based here, done all my work in the Asheville area. So some of this will be more uh, relevant to those of you that are more local to that. But a lot of the stuff spreads over the whole East Coast, unfortunately, too. Um, so just a quick overview of the presentation. I'm gonna, gonna give you a 10 to 15 minute introduction to the big picture thing. I'll talk about ecoforcers very briefly and then talk about Appalachian Coves, why they are so important. And then what are the causes? Why are invasives so bad in Appalachian Coves? And what are the impacts of uh, these invasives? Um, and then my, my colleague, Mary Van Johnston, who's our invasive crew leader, will literally get into the weeds with you. on that little, uh, little poor forestry invasives pun for you there, get going. Um, so um, really quickly, Ecoforesters, we are a nonprofit professional forestry organization dedicated to conserving and restoring our Appalachian forests through stewardship, boots on the ground work, and through education like this. Um, that's what we do. So we do everything from writing for stewardship plans for private landowners to actually implementing those plans, doing things like controlling invasive species, thanks to Mary Van's crew and their great work, doing timber sales. If you want to be a truly sustainable or hopefully even ecologically beneficial timber sales. We do outreach and educational events like this. We're always happy to partner with the Guild. They're a great um, partner for us. They also are a partner for one of our big uh, collaborations. The Sandy Mush is an area near Asheville. We have a big partnership with them and helping to restore that whole watershed, which has a major invasive species problem in it. Um, and we have advanced mapping capabilities and things too as well. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Just to let you know about me a little bit. Um, so Appalachian coves, why are they so important? Well, um, they are quite possibly the highest biodiverse forest outside of the tropics. There are more species of organisms that live in this area than anywhere outside of the tropics. Pretty amazing areas that need some special attention and care. Um, there are many rare, threatened, or endangered habitats or species. I'm not going to name or list them, but you know, salamanders and amphibians are one of the highlights here. There's uh, dozens of species that are listed as federally endangered or threatened, and then there are more, even more that are state listed. Um, also, coves, this is where streams start. Um, this is the headwaters to a lot of uh, drinking water for people and all the stream quality for fish and other aquatic animals. Really, really important um, how, how crucial these areas are for our water quality and quantity too, both for people and for uh, wildlife. So the coves are really an essential, essential natural resource for us here. Um, 
And so what makes invasive plants so bad in Appalachian coves that there's clearly something that I've observed and most folks have observed that invasives are particularly bad in coves. Well, they're, they're invasive everywhere, but they're really problem in rich coves. Um, one is coves are easier to access. They're lower elevation, usually near major roadways. There's also a lot more disturbance. These areas were often cleared and developed for agriculture because they're very productive soils and people wanted to make them and farm them when the settlers came through. So there's a lot of disturbance and now they're also much easier to develop. It's like easier to build a house in the bottom land that is up in the top of the ridge. So the ease of access and the very fertile soils led to these coves being developed initially for agriculture or pastures, but then also subsequently for housing or you know, other, other you know, recreational uses, whatever. They're very, very popular areas. Uh, have a lot of past uh, impact and disturbance on them. Um, and what happened then after you know, the settlers came through and cleared a lot of them for farmland, they realized it's actually pretty hard to farm in the mountains. And there's easier farming if you get you know, out to the Midwest or something, much rich soils out there and a lot flatter and easier. So a lot of the farms around here were abandoned you know, any time from 100 years ago up to even as little as 30, 40 years ago, a lot of farmers being abandoned around here because it was, it was hard to work it. You know, working on a mountainside, especially with a tractor, I mean, you could do it with a horse back in the day, but uh, with a tractor on there, you can't really do, can't really compete economically, financially with, um, with the current coves, just given the steepness of the land and things. So a lot of this land was abandoned. And the land was abandoned, no one knew that, but abandoned land, um, right place and disturbed land, uh, tilling the soil every year. Agriculture is actually one of the highest risks for introducing invasives because of the land being tilled. And that bare soil is, and especially fertile soil, which the coves were, was very easy for invasives to come in quickly and spread rapidly, which is what invasives do. So it's kind of a perfect conditions for them. Easy to access, roads going nearby, a vector to get the seeds there, and then these disturbed fertile soils for these invasive plants to get established and take off in and take over before the natives, which were a little slower, getting in and coming in. Um, and the main reason why invasives grow faster is they don't have any of the competitors or the pathogens or the insects that were controlling them back in their native lands. Once they were imported here, they you know, had a carte blanche to just grow and had nothing to control, no natural controls on them. So they outcompeted all the natives who had who'd kind of evolved in balance and had things to naturally control them to slow them down so they wouldn't take over. Um, and that's why we have a diverse forest because there's so much competition for things. But these, these organs were not part of the competition and now they are um, gotten ahead of things. So these really rich sites have now been really damaged by these invasive plants that love these rich, fast growing conditions, gave them a greater advantage to just compete and grow even faster. So coves have been hit hard. Um, I want to just mention two specific plants. Mary Van will talk a little more detail about things, but the two plants in particular that I want to focus on are Tree of Heaven and Asiatic or Oriental Bittersweet. Um, and these are ones that's really, really crucial to know if you have on your property because these actually can destroy healthy, mature forests. Um, so Oriental Bittersweet is that vine you see climbing over everything here. It can grow like kudzu can around here. It can grow over the top of trees. And then it shades out the tree, suppresses the tree, damages, and can eventually kill healthy, mature trees. And the tree falls down, the tree dies, and the vine just climbs over that dead and can completely take over. Uh, we've seen acres of the forest, whole acres where the trees have all been killed. They've fallen over because of bittersweet climbing them and just totally out competing them. And then the invasives just take over that acre and nothing, no native plants can come in and compete without just being strangled by the bittersweet has completely dominated those sites. Uh, the other really troubling thing with Asiatic bittersweet is it is shade tolerant. So a bird can eat a seed, fly you know, miles away to a old growth forest, deposit a fertilized seed, and in the dense shade of a you know, wilderness undisturbed area, that seed can grow just fine and will slowly climb and climb until it gets the sun and then it can really grow fast and take over the tree and produce seed and so it can, once it's established, it can spread on its own and cause much greater problems far and wide. So it's a, a huge problem. Again, we've seen acres of forest totally destroyed, like the picture here shows. The trees have just been damaged beyond repair or even killed, and they're gone. Uh, tree of Heaven's also very important to mention. 
Elanthus tree of heaven, um, because it is um, allelopathic. It actually exudes a chemical from its roots and the decaying leaves that inhibit other plants from growing. So it has an, a competitive advantage. And on top of that, it also spreads from its root suckers. It doesn't need to spread by seed. I've seen just one single tree in a pasture. A couple of years later, there'll be a hundred trees right around it. And it's just popping up from the root system. As the roots grow, it sends up new, what's called a sucker, a root sucker, which is a new sprout of the tree coming up off the roots. And uh, I went to visit one timber sale of a timber sale that I told the client, I told my client not to harvest timber because they had tree of heaven. They ignored my advice, contacted a timber buyer, had the site clear cut. I went in there and now they have a couple acres of pure tree of heaven, about three feet tall, just acres of solid tree of heaven. Nothing else is growing there. And this tree has no value. It's actually poisonous. The sawdust is even poisonous to humans, it turns out. So it has no, no value to wildlife, no value to humans, but it's taken over. And I've seen other places where up to 10 acres, 10 acres of forest that were cleared without treating the tree down those have been completely taken over by tree of heaven. It's just destroyed whole, whole acres, you know, whole stands of trees have been destroyed by tree of heaven. Um, so these ones are two that you just really, really have to control. That's kind of the worst case scenario. Um, but in general, impacts of invasives, um, why they degrade and, and how they threaten forests. One is biodiversity. They directly compete with the native plants and they um, directly compete with uh, the natural native food sources for the animals. They can even compete with the animals and, and damage them in some ways in particular. Um, two things that have happened um, in terms of the wildlife in particular I'll mention is that um, Sacred, sacred bamboo, which is a very nice name, Nandina is the genus of it, is a, is a bamboo, it's a non-native invasive bamboo, produces a nice red berry, but the birds can mistake this red berry for the native holly berries, which the birds rely on in the winter. And they'll, they've come in and eaten this Nandina berry in the winter, and it actually has killed birds because it's poisonous. It looks like you know the native holly berry, but it's very different, and it's poisonous. And birds have actually, there's documented cases of birds having died eating this Nandina berry. Um, so that's a big one there. Uh, bittersweet also, the, uh, the Oriental or the Asiatic bittersweet berry is much less nutritious than the native American bittersweet berry for animals. So they're getting a less nutritious food source from the non-native invasive plants as well. So that's a real big one. Um, also for the American bittersweet, it looks very similar to the Asiatic bittersweet and they actually can cross breed. And so the American bittersweet is a pretty uncommon plant, and it actually now is crossbreeding and it's diluting its, its native genetics. So it may actually threaten the existence of American bittersweet because there's so much more of the Asiatic bittersweet around that the gene pool has been diluted and pure American bittersweet um, may, may not be existing in the future if this keeps going on. So that's a, a really big, big uh, issue there for things. Um, one, one benefit of coves and if you can restore a cove, is that biodiversity, the more diverse a forest is, the better it is at resisting non-native invasive plants. So while invasives do threaten biodiversity, a truly rich biodiverse forest can better resist, but it can't stop invasives from coming in. But if you restore these coves, control the invasives, um, the natives will come back. And there's two key steps to controlling invasives. One is to get rid of the non-native invasives. But the second thing you have to do is you have to get the native plants reestablished on the site so that growing space is occupied so that you, know, you won't have the invasive just come back in again and reinvade and retake over. So there's two steps that you've got to reestablish the native, native plants that are there as well. Um, you know, and other things that go on with, um, with invasive, you can talk about you know, aesthetic beauty. A lot of these plants were in, intentionally imported because they've People, they looked good and they were you know, exotic and rare. Um, and they also flowered a lot. And of course, the fact that they flower profusely meant they produced a lot of seed and they spread very easy. And they were also wanted plants that were easy to grow and they sure are <laughs> easy to grow and have taken over from there. So the aesthetics though, a lot of times they take over and then it doesn't look good because you have them everywhere. It really can destroy the beauty of things. Uh, even access can become a problem. Like you, you can't, there's literally impenetrable thickets I've come across where you literally cannot get through them. And Mary Van can talk about that, her, her experience trying to get access some of these sites through these invasive thickets. Um, that can be a problem. 
Obviously they damage timber, they can damage and even kill timber uh, values. Um, Non-timber forest products, if you're trying to grow, you know, ginseng or golden seal or cohosh, you know, if you got invasives around, they're gonna take up all the growing space on the floor. Those little smaller herbaceous plants that you want in the forest are not gonna have a chance to compete with them. You have to control them. And um, even in extreme cases, invasives can actually change the water cycle. These fast growing plants soak up more water, use up more water than the native plants that have been adapted here. So they actually can reduce the water flow um, in a watershed, can actually change the water cycles um, in extreme cases. It's something that has to be pretty extreme for it has that, but it, it can affect that and sometimes. So those are kind of the major impacts that I see from a, a big picture of it. Um, the last picture I want to leave you with um, is this is a, is a picture of a, of a neighbor of a client of mine. My client really wanted to do really good work and maintain their forest, but their neighbor had a high grade timber harvest and they cut down all the big trees and did not treat the non-native invasives that were present on site before the timber harvest. And that created a whole bunch of extra space, a whole bunch of sun came in, invasives loved that being released in the sun. Of course, they weren't cutting and removing the non-native plants. So you can see those vines climbing the trees. The trees that are left there are covered up with oriental bittersweet vines and are probably gonna be damaged or killed in a few years. And the big thing is that nothing, no native tree regeneration really has a chance here because the non-native plants will outcompete it and actually directly kill it. The bittersweet will literally strangle the young trees before they can even grow to be even mid-sized trees. Um, so it absolutely is essential if you have invasives on your property before you do any kind of disturbance, whether it's a timber sale or building a hiking trail, control the invasive plants before you do any kind of disturbance, especially ground disturbance, bare soil, they'll come in, more sunlight, they'll, they'll come in and they'll outcompete and prevent the native plants from regenerating in a lot of cases. Um, so you really gotta take a careful look at assessing each site and seeing what needs to be done, the pre-treatment, the preparation before any disturbance happens. And it may take, there's been sites where we've literally, I've heard of people having to treat them for six years. Six years of control had been needed to get the invasives under control before they felt they could even try and do any kind of sustainable timber harvest or other development. So that's the biggest takeaway here is, um, and even if you don't disturb a site, you have to control the invasive. If you, let, if you leave them alone, nature is not taking care of itself anymore because of these non-native invasive plants that we've introduced. If you don't do anything, they're gonna keep spreading and growing and outcompeting the natives. But if you do some disturbance, you can make them even worse. So do something no matter what, but especially if you're gonna do disturbance, um, do, do some work to control the invasives. And that's my kind of takeaway message and point here. I've probably talked a little too long, so I will turn it over to Mary Van. Um, that's it for my presentation. I'll stop my screen sharing. All right, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, next up we have Mary Van, and Mary Van Johnston is the non-native invasives control crew leader with EcoForesters. She received her BS in environmental science with a concentration in sustainable forestry from Warren Wilson College. And she began her career in forestry with a student internship at Forest Stewards. And after college began working full time at Blue Ridge Forestry in Asheville. And Mary Van is passionate about her work at EcoForesters because of its dedication to positive impact forestry, conservation and education here in the Appalachian Mountains. So Mary Van, whenever you wanna get started on sharing your presentation, we would love to see it. And I do see a couple questions coming in, which is awesome. And we will, I'll ask those for you um, at the end of both of these presentations and they can get answered. Um, and alrighty, so Mary Van, off to you. All right, y'all. Well, um, I did see one question um, in the chat and I was trying to respond to it really quick. Um, but I think it was about Alanthus um, and bittersweet seed viability. Um, the studies that I've read so far, um, it's only a couple of years, they're, they're, they've got a high germination rate. Um, so by three to five years, I think it's down to 1% or less. Um, but of course, you never know. Um, I don't know, they're, these invasives are crazy, y'all. That's all I can say. Well, um, so I'm the uh, Invasive Species Control Crew Leader at Eco Foresters. Um, I'm also a forestry associate, so um, I work directly with landowners, uh, helping write forest management plans, um, everything to that, to actually controlling 
and bases on their property. Um, can y'all see my screen all right? Is my little little thing in the way here? Is that? We can see it. It's okay, great. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the nitty gritty kind of, as Andy said, get into the weeds um, about treating non-native invasives in our forests here in southern Appalachia. Um, it's a uh, it's a pretty interesting interesting time. Um, so uh, an overview of what I'm going to talk about um, is know your plants. We're going to have a fun little uh, uh, fun little ID game right at the beginning. Um, uh, then we're going to go into where to start, um, different methods, and uh, applicator um, choices you've got, as well as you know just kind of touch the surface on herbicides. All right, let's see if I can get the, uh, oh, here we go. All right, so first, uh, first little game we're gonna play is, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna send out a poll. So, uh, oh, it has, uh, let's see if I can get the polling plant. Number. Okay, relaunch polling. All right, so y'all, what, uh, what is this species? Is this plant a native species, a non-native species, or are you unsure? I'm gonna give everybody about five to six more seconds. All right, I'm in polling in three, two, one. All right, so 44% says non-native, uh, almost 40% says unsure, and uh, three folks said it was a native species. It is a native species. I was trying to be tricky right off the bat. Y'all are gonna have to keep an eye on me today. This is, uh, I found this the other day on a property actually. Um, oh, my slide's not working. It's Carolina Rose. So it, it looks a lot similar to a uh, multiflora rose except um, on the close up. Um, there are a couple of differences. You can see on the, uh, the thorns are really straight on a, a multiflora rose, they'll be kind of bent back and real evil looking. Um, and there are a couple other little ID things, but uh, we'll, we'll keep rocking from here. All right, here we go. We've got another, uh, we've got another species. So uh, I'm launching polling. Is this a native, non-native, or unsure? All right. All right, a couple more seconds. All right, I'm on polling. All right, 75%. All right, y'all, y'all were on it. Y'all, y'all uh, definitely got it. A couple folks were unsure, and one folk said uh, it's a native, but it's a it's our uh, tree of heaven here, or lanthus. Um, on the close up of the backside of the leaf here, um, you can see the little scent glands um, that produces that a uh, real kind of nasty peanut butter smell. It smells like rotten peanut butter to me, but um, all right, we got another one here. Moving right on along. Launch polling. Native, non-native, or unsure? All right, we got a couple couple folks weighing in here. All right, a couple more seconds. All right, I'm going to end polling. All right, non-native species, that is, that's it. Um, we've got our multiflora rose here. Um, as you can see, it looks different than that native Carolina rose. Um, it's got the bent back thorn. Um, it's also got the, uh, what they call the eyelashes at the base of the petiole, petiole. Like I say that word different every time. All right, we've got two more. This is one of them. Let's get the poll rolling here. All right, is this a native, non-native, or are you unsure? This is a tricky one. It can fool fool a lot of folks. All right, a couple more seconds. I'm in polling. All right, you know what? A lot of unsure. Sometimes I'm unsure about this one too and have to crouch down and give it a second look. Um, some folks think this is a small kudzu, but it's actually hog peanut. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of native species that are kind of look-alikes that you need to have a get a second uh, kind of get a second opinion on so just be get a little closer look to in the weeds all right let's see if I can get my presentation rolling here okay one more this is uh, our last one so uh, 
hopefully haven't been too tricky here. Native, non-native, or unsure. I've got the way it climbs, got the flowers, got the bark, got what it looks like when it's just a whole mess of it. I'm in pulling in just a second. All right. All right. Couldn't, couldn't fool you all on this one. Um, it is uh, our friend uh, Oriental Bittersweet, Bittersweet here. Um, and uh, it's a pretty, pretty scary one. All right. So let's dive right on in here. So you've got invasives on your property or uh, for on a client's property um, and you're not really sure what to do, you know, where in the heck do you start? Um, uh, it's, it's a tough question, um, but what I typically like to do is I, I try to put my blinders on. Um, I try to start looking at seed producing uh, plants first. Um, because if you can find the source and if it's seeding on your property, um, that's going to already diminish your, uh, the work you're going to have to do in the future. Um, because a lot of these, uh, everything has a seed bank. So that means um, when it hits the ground, um, it can germinate a few years after um, it's in the ground if there's been a, been a release of sorts. Um, so to find seed producers on your property, um, you know, things I look for are bittersweet in the canopy, um, like this picture here on the slide. Um, this is in Buncombe County, North Carolina last year um, with my crew. Um, that is all bittersweet vines uh, on one tree. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty bad infestation, but for this forest, uh, bittersweet was the highest priority. So what we did was we cut stemmed bittersweet um, for the first initial treatment. We're going to go back and do some foliar spraying this year. So anyway, so we targeted the seed producers. Um, we found bittersweet in the canopy going after that. Um, if you've got tree of heaven, um, you want to look for the female tree of heavens. They produce uh, abundance of seeds um, and they're pretty easy to spot, especially in the summer um, as the seed heads are developing. Um, you know, another place to start is kind of the idea. It's kind of a weird idea. It's like this threat of spread that I've come up with. And, you know, like you might ask me like, Marion, what the heck do you mean? These are all invasive plants. There's a high threat of spread, high threat of spread, but, uh, if someone has kudzu on their property, for instance, that's a pretty high threat of spread because kudzu um, can grow, uh, each vine can grow up to a foot a day, which is terrifying. Um, bittersweet uh, is also a pretty high threat of spread um, because it can grow well in the shade and in the sun. Um, Multiflora rose has a decent threat of spread. Um, it's got a seed bank that can last 10 to 20 years. That's pretty significant. Um, Tree of Heaven's allelopathic. So it can, as Andy was talking about earlier, you know, it can emit chemical and, and kill other natives around if it gets to be a grove of it. And I've seen a grove of it. Um, English ivy is really slow creeping, but it's really thick. So that's, you know, you're trying to gauge your threat of spread here, depending on what you got. Miscanthus loves disturbance. So if you're planning on a timber harvest, which I'm, go, goes into my next point, you plan on a timber harvest or a controlled burn and you've got miscanthus, that's, you want to, you want to get on top of that miscanthus as soon as possible. Miscanthus loves fire. Um, it loves disturbance. So, uh, uh, and that's becoming a really big problem in Madison County um, in West North Carolina. Um, so you want to rate your kind of threat of spread. Um, uh, do you have any ecologically significant areas on your forest or the forest you're working on? You know, do you have a really thick herb layer? Um, do you have uncommon species or rare species or endangered species? You know, do you want to work out from that ginseng patch you're growing um, to help make profit for the year? Um, you know, you want to protect it and so kind of work a bullseye ring out around it. Um, so those are, those are just some tools to keep in your back pocket about uh, kind of where to start or where to start thinking about where to start maybe. It's a lot of thinking going into all the, all the invasives treatment, I'll tell you that much. Um, but uh, uh, some things to consider, um, and it almost like uh, can be limitations. Um, so what species are you trying to target um, when you're treating? Um, how does it spread? Um, how does it grow? Um, how did it get there? Um, you know, you also want to think about uh, uh, your time of year. 
You know, if you've got a bunch of privet on your property, but you also have some other invasives that you'd like to treat, well, you can treat privet all year round um, with hack and squirt method and, and cut stem method, which we'll go into here in just a minute. Um, but, you know, so maybe, maybe saving that uh, treatment of privet for um, the winter months, for instance, and then focusing on treating your miscanthus and bittersweet uh, during the summer um, before it seeds. Uh, budget. Uh, how much money do you have if you're a landowner? You know, how much how much money can you put forward a year to either pay someone to do it, to pay uh, for the equipment you need, um, to go through it? Time budget. How much time do you have to put forward to it? Um, so there are a lot of other factors to consider in in how and where to start treating. Um, but once you kind of start thinking about all those things, it, it starts to become very clear. Um, with uh, what you need to do when. Um, but yeah, breaking it down into small chunks is, is I highly recommend that. Here we go into, into some methods. Um, so in this section, I'm gonna talk about uh, different methods that uh, you can use to actually get out there and kill some stuff. So the cut stem, cut, cut stump um, method. Uh, so essentially, this is uh, you're cutting the uh, target species um, as low to the ground as you can, um, which uh, can sometimes it, sometimes you're gonna have to cut a little higher than you want, but as close to the ground as you can um, with a handsaw or pruners, depending on or chainsaw, um, depending on how how big a diameter it is. Um, and uh, as you can see here in the picture, um, dabbing it with uh, herbicide pretty immediately after. Um, any wound you inflict on plants, you know, they, they start to send out. It's kind of like if you cut, if you get cut, your, your skin already tries to heal itself. Well, it's the same with plants. And so what the plant's going to do is it's going to start to try and kind of like seal the, uh, uh, seal the cambium layer to preserve the plant and make sure the plant doesn't, make sure it doesn't die. Um, so if you get the herbicide on that cambium as soon as possible, um, you're going to have maximum herbicide uptake from that target plant. So it's very key to you just cut and paint as you go along. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't want to wait. You don't want to wait 10 minutes or an hour. You want to go ahead and get it done. The best method, uh, cut stem, cut stump, I've found um, are bittersweet vines, no matter how big or small, um, small diameter tree of heaven. Um, uh, you do not want to hand pull small tree of heaven. Um, it, it, I'll talk about that in just a minute, but definitely always want to want to treat tree of heaven with some kind of way. It's going to kill itself with, it's going to kill it with poison, like a uh, herbicide. Uh, tall multiflora rose is actually great with cut stem, cut stump. You sometimes you have to clip your way in because, um, it's, it's a pretty mean one to, to kind of get to, but it'll save you from having to foliar spray a bunch. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes I find multiflora rose that's, that's pretty big uh, that you've got to handsaw down, um, but you'll be able to kill a lot of it if you just get to the center of it. Um, privet works well with cut stem, cut stump, uh, and uh, so does small diameter polonia. Those are all things that I have found in cove forests. So another method that works really well um, is hack and squirt. Um, and this is using a hatchet to cut in at an angle through the cambium. Um, the picture on the left hand side of the screen, um, that's a hatchet that I've just left in a tree. Um, so you can kind of see the angle of the cut. Um, but you want to cut in far enough, you want to cut into the cambium of the tree. Um, and you also want to be sure to leave space between your hacks. Um, this is so you do not girdle the tree. Um, there are certain species, or whatever plant you're working on, uh, there are certain species like Tree of Heaven where if you girdle it, it will send out a stress response and actually sprout more through the roots. Um, so you'll end up having more work down the road um, if you girdle it, um, which is kind of tricky. Uh, one way I've kind of gotten around uh, just doing one ring of of hack and squirt around a tree, especially some of these large diameter tree of heavens and polonias that we've been dealing with lately. Um, it's kind of doing like a checkerboard style thing. Um, on the on the right, uh, there's a picture. Um, you can see the blue herbicide where we've already 
uh, sprayed the herbicide in on the cambium where we've hacked. Um, but we'll do a layer where there's space around, um, do one ring and then above it do kind of like the opposite. So it'll be um, kind of like a zigzag pattern, but the uh, cambium is totally intact so it will send the herbicide down to the roots and kill the tree. It will not just girdle. So um, that's, that's pretty important, especially dealing with tree heaven or Olanthus. It's a, a key. But doing that checkerboard style and ensuring that there is cambium still intact between all of those hacks um, will get more herbicide into that target species or target plant um, to ensure it'll kill it maybe a little faster. Um, so the best, best method to control, um, you know, using the hack and swerve method is uh, tree head and polonia. Privet, again, uh, we found that uh, privet can be hacked and squirted in the winter, and that's really, really nice. Um, spacing out your treatments a little bit. Foliar spray, it's a great tool. Um, especially for things like this, car carpet's, a, carpet's a kudzu, so to speak. Um, it's a great, great way to, uh, you know, treat general leafy understory infestations. So, um, you know, small bittersweet, uh, little sprouts and stuff. Um, it's a great way to treat all that kind of stuff. You just want to make sure you're scanning constantly and just IDing everything while you're foliar spraying in a forest, because especially in rich coves, you typically have a really um, uh, a really diverse herb layer, um, you know, so you want to, you want to make sure you're not killing all your, um, all your good beneficial herbs. Um, works great for thick multiflora rose, because uh, that, that stuff's meaner and I'll get out. Um, English ivy, kudzu, honeysuckle, all kinds of stuff. Um, here's some other methods uh, that are really uh, that have their place. Um, so basil bark spray. Um, basil bark, uh, we haven't really done a whole lot of it, but it does have its place. Um, basil bark spray is best done when there's not a lot of understory growing up around whatever you're targeting um, because it's instead of mixing your herbicide with water, you mix it with crop oil. So essentially um, you're creating this really sticky poison layer for um, your target species, uh, to put it nicely. Um, and you, you want to spray it uh, about a foot, um, at least a foot, depending on the species, tall all the way around the tree. It's great for controlling thick patches of privet um, and also thick patches of tree of heaven. Um, you know, again, I would, I would hack and squirt larger diameter tree heaven before basil bark spraying, um, but if you have a lot of like three to four inch tree of heaven and it's allelopathic so it's just killed everything else, you know, and you got an acre of it, I mean, it might be worth a shot. Um, hand pulling is always an option, you know, um, it is the tough route, but uh, uh, it's, it's still a great option, um, especially if you're working around endangered uncommon species um, or, you know, like I mentioned before, maybe you're growing ginseng and you've got some bittersweet coming in, I would probably hand pull those small infestations. Um, you want to make sure you get all the roots when you hand pull. I like to shake all the dirt off and then hang the root side up in, in a nearby tree so it dries out and really dies. Um, you know, great for small uh, bittersweet infestations. Again, you want to be really careful if you're hand pulling a tree of heaven um, because if you leave any of the roots, um, it will, uh, they will sprout from the roots, any root left in the soil. Fire is a really, really cool tool. <laughs> it's a really, I guess, really hot tool. Um, <laughs> it's a really great tool for uh, treating in initially kind of for certain invasives. There have been some properties I've walked on where it's like, I'm not sure what the heck we're going to do here um, because the bittersweet is so thick. Um, but uh, for invasive species reduction, if, you know, your forester says it's right and everything can be set up, doing a controlled burn um, during the dormant month and then as month, during the dormant season, excuse me, and then during the uh, growing season, the following growing season, following of the foliar spray to get all the little stuff and, and cut stem for whatever the fire didn't kill that might, might have been climbing, um, that will uh, greatly uh, 
reduce the amount of herbicide you need to lay down. But again, that's something to talk with the forester about if you've got a really bad infestation. You also want to be careful with uh, other plants that could be there like Mescanthus, um, because if you're rolling through with a controlled burn, um, that might be uh, just a pretty crazy way to spread Mescanthus that you might not have realized was there or anything like that. But All right applicator containers. So these are all containers we use um, to get the herbicide out there and, and onto, the, onto the stuff we don't want. Um, so we've got some shoe polish bottles that we use. Um, those are great for cut stem. Um, we use them a lot for uh, if you know, the diameters of the uh, bittersweet aren't gonna exceed, you know, I don't know, four inches or something like that. If, if they are, and they sometimes do, um, we'll use a little bit more, um, a little bit, one of the uh, hand spray bottles, but shoe polish bottles are great. You can put them in your pocket. They've got a lid on them. Um, as a landowner, if you're just walking around and you see something here and there, it's perfect. Um, the hand spray bottles are also really nice for cut stem, but they're really, um, they really shine in hack and squirt. Um, I really like the gray or the silver one with the blue handle. Those are the best. Um, you wanna make sure you're getting chemically resistant um, hand spray bottles um, because the ones that are not chemically resistant will not last you longer than a time or two using them. Um, the hand pump bottle, the one in the middle, um, I was able to find those at the uh, local Ace Hardware here near, near the house, um, but the silver, gray, blue ones that are my favorite, I haven't been able to find them in the last couple of months, um, but I found some online. Um, the backpack sprayers, uh, those are uh, the, the kind we use there, are great with the hip belt. Hip belt and chest belt, those are optimal um, for getting around steep slopes, ducking through, all kinds of stuff you got to duck through to get in there and foliar spray. Um, you don't want to be thinking about how much your backpack sprayer hurts your back or your shoulders while you're trying to target specific species. So going big or going home with your backpack sprayer, hands down worth it, hands down worth it. All right, we're going to dive into herbicides. I got just a little bit of time here for some questions. So know your herbicides, know their limits. Uh, you always want to read the label of whatever herbicide you're getting. Um, the label is the law. Um, so the label is going to tell you what PPE you need, um, but you typically need long pants, long sleeves, PVC coated gloves, and iPro. Um, and uh, the label will also tell you all kinds of things like limitations about maybe temperature or mix rates or uh, if it affects the water table like groundwater or if it's water safe or toxic. Um, so it's the labels are kind of tedious to go through but it's always worth reading them several times over before you go out. Um, you have to read them at least once through, but I, I like to read them multiple times um, to make sure definitely understand everything that's going on there. Um, uh, three uh, herbicides that are pretty common um, are uh, triclopyr, uh, glyphosate, and clopyrrolid. I don't think I said that last one well. I just call it clopy. Um, but triclopyr is great for targeting uh, woody plants, um, so like your bittersweet and, and things like that. Glyphosate is great for broadleaf um, plants, but also uh, does target woody stem as well. Um, it just takes a little longer to kill the woody stem than the triclopyr. Um, Clopyrrolid is great for targeting legumes, so your, your kudzu. Um, I've had a lot of success treating kudzu that had um, uh, understory herbs under it, um, but needed to be released. Um, and the clopy killed the kudzu and released everything underneath. Um, so it's great, but you cannot use it near water. So read your, read your labels, everything like that. Those are just the general ones I, I like to use. Um, and we're moving on from there. So salt-based, ester-based, there is a difference. Um, salt-based, you have a lot more stable formula. Um, it's best used in the warmer months. Um, it doesn't work quite as well in the cooler months, but your ester-based or oil-based, um, those work really well in cooler weather, but they have a higher vaporization rate. So essentially they'll vaporize into clouds 
um, above a certain temperature, depending on your herbicide, depending on concentrations and things like that. So you just want to be really careful and you want to make sure that you know what you're using. You don't necessarily want to be using an ester-based herbicide in the middle of July down here in West North Carolina um, foliar spraying. Um, you might you might have a lot of a lot of drift uh, of some non-target species you, you hit. Surfactant and dye, those are very important things to have in your herbicide as well. Um, surfactant is just some kind of oil to bind it and help that herbicide stick to whatever you're applying it to. And the dye helps you see what you treated. Um, simple as that, it's worth paying for the dye. Uh, ratios of concentration for method, you don't wanna be putting down too much herbicide. Um, you don't wanna be wasting your money essentially um, because sometimes 50% solution will kill um, whatever you're targeting with hack and squirt, you don't need to use 100%, but sometimes you do. It depends. You should read your label. Um, but uh, if you pay attention to your ratios of concentrate, um, you won't be putting down too much chemical and you also won't be throwing money down the drain. You'll be given the perfect amount to um, uh, achieve your goal of treating whatever you need to treat. Alrighty, let's see here. I reckon we've got some time for some questions. Yeah, thanks, Mary Van. That was a great presentation. Um, we do have a couple questions that we have a few minutes to answer. Um, the first one that I kind of just want to go back to is the question about um, how long lived are the seed banks of some of these invasives, um, particularly oriental bittersweet and ailanthus. I know you've talked about that a little bit, um, but I think it's important to kind of ask that question again and really send the message home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Alanthus and bittersweet typically have a few, a couple of years of viability, um, seed viability. Um, and then after that, the germination rate decreases pretty significantly. Um, the last study I read about Alanthus or, or tree of heaven, um, or tree of hell, some people call it, um, <laughs> uh, by five years, the germination rate is like 1%. Um, and with bittersweet, I think after three years, it's, it's in the single digits as well. Um, and so it's, some of the invasives really don't have a long time to have a, uh, have a go at, you know, getting established. But, um, the tricky bit about that is, is that if there's an infestation nearby, birds, birds can spread it, wind can spread it in. Um, so that's why finding your seed source is, um, really important um, and that way you can kind of get a gauge on how severe it could be for X amount of years essentially. Yeah thank you um, and then another question we have um, that was asked was there are there any laws to encourage landowners to deal with invasives um, or people who clear clear cut releasing invasives that contaminate someone else's property Oh, yeah. um, and Rob Lamb did give an answer saying that sometimes forestry current use property laws require invasive assessments so you can leverage that but I was curious if whether you Mary Van or Andy had anything else to add. I, I wish that you know there was yeah I mean some yeah I think Rob Rob did a good job answering that one but yeah unfortunately there's not really a there's not really a lot of incentive. Um, one thing that I have uh, uh, found is working with landowners is essentially encouraging talking to your neighbor. And sometimes, you know, neighbor relations aren't the best or you've got an absentee landowner neighbor that's never around or, um, but yeah, working with your neighbors um, or at least starting the conversation in a kind way um, is, uh, is the best way to you know, it's tough. It's tough. You know, invasives know no boundaries and they don't stop at your property boundary or your neighbor's property boundary, unfortunately. Yeah, very true. Andy, I think you might be muted if you are trying to respond. Yeah, uh, sorry, I do. I was muted. Um, another there is one opportunity for funding, at least I know of, through the 
National Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, their EKIP program, Environmental Quality Improvement Program, you can get some cost share funding for invasives control if you combine it with other treatments, other forest stand improvement or even other agricultural improvements, you can get some funding for that. But yeah, the, the, the big thing that we've used around here is you know the, the present use value program. If someone's in forestry use, it reduces their property taxes dramatically around here. It can be like a 90 cent property tax break, but you have to be doing sound forest management. And we actually will tell people in our plans that one of the requirements to for us to be to run this plan for you is that you have to do some control. It's not sound management if your invasives are taken over and damaging your forest. Um, so um, you can use that major tax savings to give them some some motivation, but there's, there's very little enforcement of that law. Um, All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, are there any suggestions on dealing with air potato vine? Um, just cutting it, and, that's, uh, <laughs> and that sounds real simple, but uh, uh, anytime you got anything that's climbing, um, my biggest thing is, is try to keep it from climbing. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, how, how bad is it? You know, um, is there a way that I can interact? Hey, you know what, actually, uh, the air potato uh, vine question asker. Um, I've got my email there at the bottom corner. Um, uh, there can be several approaches. Um, so if you shoot me an email, we can talk more about it. But definitely, if you got any vines, if you've got any climbing vines, uh, air potato, you know, bittersweet, um, uh, uh, what are the other ones? Um, honeysuckle. Uh, best thing to do is is cut them off as soon as you can. I mean, that'll keep the infestation at least lower um, or try to hand pull them if you can, you know, I mean. Yeah, and if you cut and, and treat that freshly cut stump to kill the roots if possible, if it's big enough. Yeah. Or if you can find a selective herbicide, like the triclopyr, it just kills the woody plant. If it's growing on something non-woody where the, the spray shouldn't have too much damage on the other non-target plants. Um, can help those. So you can find some targeted um, things like cloparillid was one Mary I mentioned that's specific to legumes and to do some research on air potato. And there's lots of stuff on the internet, uh, most of it pretty good that you can find. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I reckon it just depends on how, how bad the air potato is too. Um, but yeah, if you've got any further questions, I can, I'd be happy to, happy to answer nitty gritties about air potato with me asking you some questions too. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. And I'm sure either Mary Van or Andy would love to take questions if you all end up having them at the end of this presentation or anything else. And it looks like uh, Robert Lamb just put them, the emails into the chat box if you wanna save those and ask any, any questions. Um, I do have one final question and it's actually, a personal question from me that I'm curious about. And what is your opinion or do you do any treatment for these, some plants that are considered invasives that are native like poison ivy? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, a lot of landowners uh, definitely ask us to treat native vines that are really taking over. Um, I don't know if y'all have ever been in a forest of essentially just poison ivy thickets. Um, but it's, it's pretty, pretty tough. Um, we do, we, if sometimes like you get native grapevine that, that creates grape slicks, um, smoke vine can sometimes do that too. Um, with any native vine, um, we never treat it with herbicide. Um, essentially, uh, if it's a, if it's a big problem, um, we'll just cut it. Um, you know, grape slicks are great um, for wildlife. They provide a lot of berries and, and habitat and things like that. Um, but if you're trying to do a timber sale or uh, uh, you know, other forms of management, or maybe it is just too much grape, um, cutting some of that grape um, and you don't necessarily need to herbicide it um, will help release that forest. But with poison ivy, um, you definitely want to be careful uh, when you cut poison ivy because of the um, the uh, what is it called? 
erythral oil, the, that oil that gives you the, the rash, essentially um, you can inhale it through the um, sawdust. So I got some all over my face once from just cutting a lot of poison ivy. So it's uh, 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 the, the sawdust hit my face a bunch. So you just want to be, be very careful. Um, but yeah, you can, you can definitely um, kind of, you can also selectively kind of cut here and there with some native stuff too. Um, but no, another uh, note on that is that, so, you know, poison ivy is a threat to human health sometimes. It's not really a threat to forest health. You know, grapevines can get very, very dense and can damage trees, can be overly dense sometimes. And they can just be cut and not herbicided to reduce that problem. Poison ivy, if it's around a trail or something, you could treat it just because you don't want it to be causing human health problems, but it's not going to cause any forest health problems. It's actually a really good seed, seed source for birds to eat the seeds. So that's, that's just our opinion on, on a poison ivy. Great, thank you. Well, we're getting to the top of the hour and I had to have a couple other things to close out on, but yeah, thanks Andy and Mary Van um, for joining us today. This was a great presentation and I've enjoyed it and I hope everybody else has too. Um, our next final event in this series will be on Friday, November 6th. We'll be joined by the Friends of the Cheat River from West Virginia to talk about the amazing aquatic biodiversity in the central Appalachians and the Appalachian region and the current threats to the hydrology and what forest management can do to help in protecting these resources. And so today um, we had, yeah, a great presentation. Um, it was very focused to landowners as well, which was very special. Um, but if you are a forester looking for SAF CFE credits, um, we will be sending out information about that after this webinar. Um, so stay and look out for that if that's something that you're interested in. And Jen just put the registration link into um, into the chat box for the next and final webinar in this series on November 6th. So I hope to see you all there and thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you all. Thanks y'all.